Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eduia, and I entreat Sintich to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help those these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of love. Book of, life. book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will be will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is, is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Good morning, everyone. I could not believe that rain this morning. I, I guess I could believe it, but good night, nurse. It's like I took a second shower this morning just walking over to the church building. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our most high and awesome God, you are holy and good and gracious and every good word that we could ever come up with in any language ever could not descri describe the goodness of you. That you, Lord, are the one who sits in heaven, who created the heavens and the earth. And you have given so much to us, including your son. Father, we can never thank you enough. And so help us that as we seek after you, that we would do what you need us to be doing. That we would carry your light and your love into the, the darkest trenches of this world. That we would find the people who feel hopeless, that they have nothing left, and that we might give them something worthwhile. You, O oh Lord, our mighty God, are worthy of our praise. Help us, Lord, this morning that we would give you the best of the best of the best that we could possibly give, that you would have our entire hearts, that you would have our entire attention, that this morning we'd be transformed into better people. You are good, and we love you, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In his teaching, Jesus was saying, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive their greater condemnation. But he sat down opposite of the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came, put in two small copper coins, which amount to cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more money than all the contributors of the treasury. But they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty. But in all she owned, and all she had to live. That's Mark chapter 12, if you're wanting to read that later. What, what an amazing scenario that takes place here. And so when Jesus is teaching and he's preaching, and he's going to all these different places, oftentimes he'll say, this is what got my attention and what should get your attention as well. And he brings up a couple different people. There are those who seek attention for themselves. They do things and they dress in such ways that, that people look at them and go, wow, look at them. You know, the Pharisees were, were certainly like that. And so many times you look at the Pharisees and, Pharisees and we say that they are bad guys because they, they contrasted a lot of things that Jesus would say. But for the people of that time, they would look at the Pharisees and say, how could anyone be more righteous than these? A lot of ways the Pharisees painted that image. They're the ones that, that brought out rumors like that. And Jesus shows them how they did it. 
They wear the nice long robes and walk around in it. Again, wearing long robes is not sinful, but walking around as if you are the, the epitome of holiness through your long robes and through your attire, then that is a problem. They would walk around in such places and present these long-winded prayers and very eloquent in their speech because they're well-read. And people look at them and they go, wow, look at them. Just bring attention to themselves. You know, behind the scenes, they would manipulate the types of taxes and whatnot, and they would take the houses right out of widows' possessions who have already lost their family, who have already not really had much income as it is, and now taking away their place where they would live. And Jesus warns, okay, they're going to have their condemnation. And he says, out of everything that he saw that day, whether it's the rich people dumping in all their coins into the collection basket, you know, a waterfall of sound coming through there. He said, one thing caught my attention today, and that was the puny sound of two little copper coins going into the collection basket. As he looks over, it's just this little widow lady. It's just this little woman who she's giving the last of what she has. She's doing something very uncomfortable here, but where she's forfeiting all control in her life. But this is the only ability that she has to eat dinner. That night. You know, the Pharisees, they're going to eat like kings, but who knows what's going to happen to this little woman. She gives away all control in her life to the Lord. You know, I, I, we're at the end of this series here of the joy of our worship. And what a blessing it's been, at least for me. I've learned so much about how I can offer better worship to God, how I can prepare better for it. I think it's just been good. And so in the light of that, I titled this sermon, uh, The Joy of Our Giving, Part 1. Because when I was writing this out the other day, I found that it was just way, way, way too long. I was working until like 1030 last night. And just went, this is too long. I have to cut out a huge section of it. So, so this is part one, and you'll get part two in two weeks, because next week Rodney's going to be preaching for us. But I understand that giving isn't always this, like, jump up for joy kind of a thing. Sometimes giving really hurts, especially if you're doing it right. But where I give out of my poverty instead of my surplus, where I give in such a way that, you know, I understand that that's not going to be replenished. That maybe that's not going to ever come back to me. I, I'm just giving because I want to give. There are times that giving is, is a lot like that, and it's because that's what we're doing. Forfeiting control. And that is a very uncomfortable subject, yet there is still joy in it. I want you to know a couple things before we really get into this. It is First, this isn't one of those sermons that where I'm going to say, you ought to put a lot more money in the basket. I, I, I need your bucks here. Um, you need to understand this, and I need to make this as clear as possible. Your donations do not make me more wealthy. There are people out there that would love to take your monies for their personal gain. I do not gain personally from your contributions here. I think the church in, in a whole does, but Brandon does not. I, I do not get to have any say in what you do with your money. But ultimately, through this study, what, what I'm hoping is we rely less on ourself and material things and rely more on God. If we leave this morning but with this renewed attitude of, I rely entirely on God instead of my IRA or my 401k or my social security or my investments, and I say, today was a success. That's what we're here for. As Rodney mentioned, we're celebrating our God. And right now we're, we're using God's word to, to transform us to sharpen us, and so that we have our eyes directed only to Christ and not on anything else, anything that would distract me and keep me away from being the best possible disciple of Christ that I could possibly be. That's what today is about. And I bet you guys weren't really expecting a sermon on giving this early on, especially after the pounding that you gave me and Catherine. We're still recovering from it. You know, we we had come here with you guys paying for our tickets and paying to have our, our little things that we had shipped over here to a, a kitchen filled with food. I couldn't believe it. Our, our cabinets filled to the brim with food. And for that, I, I thank you. And, and I, I thank you in, in this other context that our, our dog has had so many treats and so much food that we've actually had to put her a little bit on a diet here because she's gaining weight here. 
you know, this is a very giving church. This is a very giving congregation. And so you might be wondering, well, why are we talking about giving if we're so good at it? Because God talks a lot about giving. This is a very important thing for God. And, and as a minister, as someone who's still early on in his ministry, I, I rely so much on your giving. And I, I have benefited so much from the giving of the church. And not just me, but all ministers. There, there's a guy who works at Sunset International Bible Institute named Terry Williams. Terry, he, he's the dean of, I, I think, the graduate program. But every year in January, Sunset puts on their Sunset Vision Workshop. It's a big lectureship. And they asked Kerry one year if he would come down and he'd teach on restoring our devotion to the church. And it, it's, a, it's a marvelous lesson. You can find it on YouTube. But he starts it out by, by bringing up a, a couple different ways that he considered taking the lesson. He said, I, I could have talked about how the church is just so good and how I can go after story after story after story of the good things that the church has done. And he then moved on to like his full on lesson. But it's just this, this little offhand comment that is so impactful to me. This is what he said. As a preacher who looks back at 26 years of ministry, this is the most humbling thing in the world. That every tank gas that I have ever burned and every meal that my children have eaten is because of the generosity of sweet little widow ladies. Everything I've ever had, every home that I've ever lived in is because of the generosity and the goodness of the finest people in the world. I agree with that. That the livelihood of ministers is built on the generosity of the church. He went on to mention a, a couple of stories. He, he said, you know, early on in my ministry, we had cars that were breaking down left and right. Been there, done that, right? And, and he said he had to take his car to the mechanic. And, and when it was time to pay the bill, he found out one of the elders had stopped by and paid the bill. He said there was a time that he was a, a minister in Alabama. And, and there was one of the ladies there. She had to have a new kidney. And she'd been waiting on list after list after list. Until one of the sisters from church came up and said, why don't we share my kids? Doesn't that just cut you to the heart? And when, once they went to the hospital and they, they did the procedure, the husband went down to pay the bill and someone else had paid. It, the church is a generous group of people. And it's because we are made in the image of God and we reflect the attributes and the characteristics of God. And yet he still tells us over and over to give. I think of so many stories in my life of how people had not just given something to me, but I, I just been, I, I feel the effects of the giving of the church. And there's story after story that I can't tell you because people want to remain anonymous. And that's perfectly fine. But I will tell you this story. It is when I first went to Alaska, I was looking at Kodiak to, to see if that was a place that I wanted to, to be established for a little bit and preach for a little while. And one of the guys named, named Richard, he is one of the best guys in the whole world. He went around to all the different people at the church and said, hey, there's this kid. He, he wants to work for us. Um, what would you mind work or giving a little more on the contribution so we could pay him something of a salary? And most people, I think all of them said, yep, yeah, more than happy to. But he went to the house of this little widow lady named Marcy. And he told Marcy, you know, hey, we got this. Kid. And she said, well, how much do you want to you want to pay him? You know, he gave her the number and she wrote that whole number on a check and gave. It to him. She single handedly. Paid for my first year in ministry. Man, God is good. Goodness. I didn't do this when I was practicing. <laughs> and so Sunday after Sunday, once I started, you better believe I went to her house and I really got to know her. And she was such a blessing to my life. She was just. And when she had eventually passed away at 94 years old, uh, they, the family asked if I would do her funeral. And you better believe I, I did the best job that I possibly could. And, and they even asked me if, I would be willing to, to lower the casket into the grave because they didn't have the electric ones. I did it to the best of my ability. I didn't drop her. <laughs> I, I tried my best to take such good care of her because of what she had given to me in my family. God talks so much about giving. 
giving from a heart overflowing with God's grace, whether it's mandatory or voluntary, has always been the ideal for God's people. It's never been, well, I'll just give when I'm ready to give. Give now. Okay? That, that's what it's all about. And I look back at the, at the Bible and to see that some of these topics that, that are discussed the most. You know, if I were to ask you, what, what does the Bible talk most about? A lot of people would probably say belief. Right? That, that's a huge topic. Faith and belief. And yeah, that's mentioned uh, 272 times throughout all 66 books of the Bible. A lot of times. But maybe praying, maybe that's one that talks about a little bit more. And yeah, that's right, 371 times that the Word of God talks about praying. I mean, that's that's communion with God here. How about love? I mean, John, First John chapter 4, it talks about love one another, that God is love himself. And just over and over and over, it talks about love. And yeah, that's 714 times. But the Word of God talks about giving and generosity 2,162 times. Doesn't that just blow your mind? That, that Yes, God is very loving and he wants us to pray to him, but he commands us to give. The reason why God so strongly commands us to give is because he himself is an expert at giving. He's already given so much from his pockets. And we could go on for days trying to list all the things that God has given us from the great big things to every single breath that comes into our lungs and then right back out. God gives us so much, but here's a small list of the things that God has given. He's given humans authority and dominion over all the animals that are in the earth. We are the rulers here. God gave us an entire world to live in and a universe beyond it so that we could explore. He gave Abraham and Sarah a child. He gave Israel a law and a land to live in. He gave David a throne. He gave Solomon wisdom. He gave Nineveh a second chance. And he gave sinners his only begotten son, so that whoever would believe in him should not perish, have eternal life. What hasn't God given to us? You know, I've heard it said, well, it's different with God. If God gives something, he could just make another. Can he? And yeah, that might be the case with some of the things that God gives us. You remember when Israel was wandering in the wilderness and they're saying how hungry and how thirsty we are. And God gave them quail and manna every single day up to their nose. Nose is multiple. They had so much that they said, we're sick of this. You know, they, they had water that poured from rocks for them. And it was just replenished over and over and over again. But there were times where God gave and it hurt. And I think that's a reflection for us. It's a lesson for us. You remember when Israel demanded a king? They said, we want to be like the rest of the nations. And God said, no, you're not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be the center of everything that you are, of your entire nation. And they said, give us a king anyways. God delivered. He gave them King Saul and then David and Solomon. And, and you know, the rest of the life. And you saw where that got them. How could we ever look at God sending his only son and say, he could just make it there, There's only three parts to the Godhead. There is the Father and, and the Son and the Spirit. And he already gave us the Son, but he also gave us the Spirit. And, and those two work so that we get closer to the Father, where he gives himself to us. God gave us everything, including himself. And because giving is such a big part of God's existence, God commanded Israel to give. Right? You, you remember that this weird word that you find through the Word of God called Tithing. Do you remember how much the tithing was out of their annual income? You remember it? 10%. That's, that's the most common answer. That's what everyone says. And sure, you find that. In Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 to 29, you have this tithe called the Lord's tithe or the first tithe. And it's meant to be where you, you take 10% out of your annual income, give it to the, the temple or the tabernacle, tab, tabernacle at the time. Easy for you to say. And that's supposed to be for the Levites, so that they could do their job, their priestly duties, without being hindered with a nine to five. And a lot of times people price match that. You know, well, that's what Israel did, and so that's what I'll do. When I give my contribution, it'll be 10% of my overall salary, and that's well and good. But I want you to know that Israel was commanded to give more. The tithe wasn't just 10%. That tithe was, but there's more out there, actually. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 to 29, you have this one called the festival tithe, or the second tithe, 
And it's another 10% out of the uh, annual income that you would get. And it's dedicated to the festivals that, that would eventually be made. You know, the, 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 what do you call that? The Feast of Boots, the, the Passover Feast, all of these. And it's meant to be a uh, religious community around. You know, it's designed so that the whole group of Israel comes close together. And this is supposed to be after they capture the, the land of Canaan. In Deuteronomy 14, it says, You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God. All this is dedicated to come closer to who God is. There was another tithe, though. And this is another 10%. But instead of this being every year, it was every three years. Okay, So if you're keeping track, we're already at 23%. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 and 29, this is dedicated to the Levite, dedicated to the alien, the orphan, and the widow as well. So that if anyone is in a position where they are financially poor, if they're poverty, they can take from this pool and be able to eat and survive. God took care of everybody, including the poor people. And wouldn't you believe it? There's another tithe out there that Israel had to conform to. This one is called, well, it's it's a tax instead of a tithe, but it's the same thing. Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 32 to 33. This is where you find this. This is what Nehemiah records. We also placed ourselves under the obligation to contribute nearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. For the things that's inside of the temple. That's what this tax is for. So if you're keeping track, we had... 10% for the Lord's tithe, 10% for the festival tithe, 3% for the, the poor tithe, and then 2% for this temple offering. A quarter of their annual income was dedicated to be given to the community of Israel. A lot of people, again, they price match the 10%. The 25%, that is, that is a test of faith, isn't it? On top of this, I mean, this is just the, the requirement to give. There were optional offerings that you can also give. There was one called the first fruit offering. From Numbers chapter 18, verses 11 through 13, th this is what it says. All of the best of the oil and all of the best of the wine and of the grain, the first fruits of what they give to the Lord, I give you. The first, the, the first ripe fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring to their Lord, shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it. Hey, first fruits. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. Say you're a farmer and you have just a wonderful harvest or even a terrible harvest. You go out into the field and you take the best and the first of whatever is out there. And you say, this is going to God because thank you, God, for giving me a harvest anyways. It goes just in, in, in a sense of thankfulness. And this really contrasts Cain. Remember how Cain, yes, he, he'd give fruits, vegetables, but his heart wasn't in it. And he only gave out of what, what he had kind of left over instead of the first that he could give to God. There was one more, and that was a free will offer. From Exodus chapter 25, I mean, they, they just barely got the Ten Commandments, and, and they're still wandering in the wilderness here. It says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, that they may take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the, the contribution from me. So all, all this is, is God tells Moses, just open it up to anyone. If you guys feel like it, you want to give just a little bit more. If there's just this thing moving in you and you say, I just want to give back to God, please bring it forward whenever you want. And the response is, humbling. come here with me in Exodus chapter 36. Exodus 36, I'm going to start here in verse 2. It says, then Moses called Bezalel and Ahiliah, and every skillful person in whom the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to the work to perform it. They received from Moses all the contributions which the sons of Israel had brought to perform the work in the, constant, in the construction of the sanctuary. And they still continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. And the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary, they came. 
each from the work which he was performing. And they said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the Lord has commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command and a proclamation which was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contributions of the sanctuary. But really pay attention to this. Thus, the people were restrained from bringing any more. For the materials that was sufficient, it was more than enough for the work that they had to perform it. Okay? The, Israel was bringing so much that their hearts were just saying, give, give, give so much that Moses had to literally stop them and keep them from bringing more because they didn't have space for it. They said, we, we have enough, but we're ready to build here. And people just kept bringing more and more and more. That is the joy of giving. I'm sure a lot of those gifts hurt. I'm sure a lot of those gifts came from their poverty. Just because my, my neighbor was giving more, I'm, I'm going to try to outdo him. I'm going to give a little bit more, you know? Don't you just love it? That's the joy of giving. That, that is, that's what we're talking about. But oh, how people change. Now, at this point, yes, Israel is inspiring in the way of their giving, but Fast forward centuries after their kings, after the Babylonian captivity, and they're back in Israel and they're kind of worshiping in their makeshift temple. And it's just not the same anymore. Remember when we started this series, we, we went to Malachi and we looked at Israel and how Israel was offering this half-hearted worship to God. They weren't giving God their best. They, they, they in fact, would only show up on occasion, and God accuses them of robbing him. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? He responds, in your tithes, your contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me. The whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that they that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. At some point, Israel got into this point of attitude and said, I just need more and more, more, more. And they just kept it for themselves. They forgot about what it means to take care of one another. And they, they lost the joy of giving. And I wonder if Christians in the 21st century are, are starting to forget about the joy. In our American mindset, we, we want to have big houses filled to the brim with stuff, unless you're the Maccabers. I know they like to have the minimalist house with nothing in there. What an attitude they have. I don't need more. I, I don't need to just be surrounded by things anymore. I don't need to have my, my bank accounts just overflowing with money. Because I know there's people who need my help. Like I said, I, I had to split this up between two different two different lessons because it just went so long. And so I'm really excited for the, the next time that we get together for, for this. It's part two, man. It's going to knock your socks off. It's so good. I, I'm maybe a little biased here. Sometimes people can get a little stingy. That they don't give hardly at all. Sometimes people give, but it's only for show. Like wearing long robes or giving these long-winded prayers. Everyone hear the, the amount of money that I dropped in the collection basket here? But some people, they're willing to give with their hearts so full of God's grace that they're willing to forfeit control within their lives. And that takes some serious. I've been humbled by the generosity of the to, to the point where I, I'm going, I am not giving. Maybe you're in a position this morning where you don't give, but you want to give a little bit more. Maybe you're in something of a dry spell in your following of Christ, and you're wondering, well, what is it that I could do just a little bit more to saturate my, my experience with God? And I'm, I'm wondering if giving is the thing that you're missing. Look at how much that God has given to us. How could we keep anything for ourselves? If this morning you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, and maybe that's what you're missing. Scripture tells us that to make him the Lord of your life, to be added to his church is to clothe yourself with Christ 
through the waters of baptism. If you have to do that this morning, we are happy to, to oblige, to make that a, a, rea a reality for you. And if you have any other needs this morning, make them known now. So stand.